Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome back to the afternoon uh, session. This is going to be our second last um, session of the, uh, of the Business Forum, and we're very pleased uh, to say to we've got two uh, people who have got a great deal of experience of uh, developing and running businesses across the CIS. So in this session, we're going to hopefully uh, learn from their experience and, and hear, I suppose, a practical guide of what to do, how to do it, uh, etc., what, what to be wary of. Um, as always, I should remind you at the start that we have the, have the app systems you're all familiar with to uh, submit any questions. And also, of course, if you wish to uh, personally ask a question to indicate that, if you can use the, 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 the lectern. Um, so my two guests this afternoon, um, on my right is Andrei Filatov. Andrei is General Manager for Russia and the CIS at IBM, a position that he took up from 2015. But uh, Andrei has been working with, uh, with IBM since early 2010 in the sales technology group and has over 20 years experience working in the IT sector. Uh, and as we heard yesterday and have been hearing from questions right through this forum, IT and technology is very much to the forefront um, in terms of what people are looking for, opportunities in, in that area. And then to Andres' uh, right is uh, uh, Kamran Siddiqui. And Kamran is based here in Dubai. He's group chief executive uh, for Visa, uh, covering Central, Eastern Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And from the Dubai office, he oversees development and managing over 90 different countries, including Russia and the CIS. Uh, Cameron has a great deal of experience in developing consumer, retail, financial services, having worked in Melbourne at ANZ. Um, between uh, 89 and 99, uh, Cameron worked for Citibank in developing markets across the Asia Pacific, including Singapore, Thailand, Pakistan, etc. So a great deal of experience in building businesses. Um, so this afternoon's session is called Finding New Roads, Leveraging the CIS Opportunity. Uh, essentially, how do you take advantage of this growing, emerging market uh, to build your business? So let me start off first and ask Andre perhaps to just give a, 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 a better description of what you do, uh, what, what uh, the business environment for IBM is, is right now, and, and, and how you see the trends and the opportunities in Russian CIS. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, IBM actually started business in Soviet Union back in uh, 1974. Uh, not so many American companies worked at that time in, in Soviet Union. So the roots are very deep, actually. So for the uh, last few years, we experienced both the hyper growth when business was growing very fast and every quarter was like strong double digit increase. And then also the negative and uh, um, 2008 crisis started. Right now we have even deeper crisis with uh, very cheap oil prices which are impacting a ruble. And then we see that all surrounding countries that we call CIS countries, they also started to experience economical problems. Local currencies devaluating, uh, governments are struggling with fulfilling social obligations, and we see that budgets of the clients are getting less than local currencies, but also if you calculate it in the hard currency in euros or dollars, you see that uh, decrease is actually very high. So e economy is not good, but is there opportunity for business? For sure. Because uh, when you have hyper growth, you don't think about efficiency, right? And when you come with IT technology to the, to the big companies, big corporations, they uh, do not see it as a, as a essential part so it's nice to have but it's uh, if uh, your demand of growth is fulfilled anyway then you it's your second secondary priority what we see now that everybody is concerned with efficiency so every company every organization government owned or private they're looking for efficiency and if you look for efficiency and you have technology and you have um, methodology, how to address efficiency topics, how to make more with less, then you have business opportunity. Mm -hmm. So that's what we are focusing now. We're focusing on the areas where we can get 
um, for the client significant improvement on efficiency sure. of their business on all aspects. Okay. Uh, let me ask you a basic question, which I, I asked you in, inside, but I think it would be interesting to give the answer again. Um, I'm showing my ignorance here, but my impression always of IBM was just a great big machine, a computer that you bought yeah. and plugged in. But as you explained to me, IBM is not about that anymore. Be, I think it'd be very useful if you were to I'll set out what IBM actually does now. What, what is the nature of the business? Yeah, IBM as a global company is transforming uh, maybe for the whole its history, which has started back to 1911. And IBM is among the, uh, I would say, oldest companies in the world. And IBM would not survive if IBM would not be transforming itself into something new to reflect the market, market change and um, and technology is a key aspect. If you're a technology company, your technology is getting old very fast, right? So you need to invent. So IBM is investing like $6 billion every year in research and development. But it's not only that. Not uh, many people apparently know that IBM, uh, IBM does uh, business process outsourcing. So last year in Russia, we opened the delivery center where we do outsourcing for our clients for such business processes like accounting. Because we uh, invested in shared services concept many years ago. And IBM now internally, we uh, centralized the most of the processes, starting from the back office processes and uh, ending up with uh, technical experts who can be located in one country, in one center, but the expertise can be delivered mm -hmm. to many other countries, to the different uh, customers around the world. And we reached the level of sophistication when we can, <coughs> using, using our shared services center, offer it to our clients as outsourcing model. And it works very well. So we see that our center is very successful. It's more than 400 people now. We're expecting like 1,200 people next year. Mm -hmm. So we're going to invest, so we see the big opportunity. And technology-wise, the hardware was a significant part of our business for many, many years, and it is still a significant part of our business. But if we see the growth areas, it's more around such uh, a technologies like uh, cognitive analytics, for example, which is a fantastic new opportunity that IBM is exploring now and offering to its clients, where the level of quality of predictive analytics is reaching the level when it's uh, literally seen as artificial intelligence, right. that uh, systems can help people to reach new uh, level of uh, business excellence, mm. because we're bringing it to the business. So as a result, business needs to be better. Okay, thank you. Um, Cameron, if I can ask you about uh, Visa's business, uh, I guess it's fair to say that your business grew nicely as the economies in Russia and across CIS were growing, and uh, I guess fair to say that the downturn is, is, is impacting kind of all areas of the economy. How is Visa, you know, uh, how is your business now across the region? How do you view the challenges? What, what, what are you doing to adapt or to uh, in the, these changing circumstances? Where do you see the opportunities as well? So it, it may be useful for me to just uh, uh, talk a little, bit, a little bit about Visa, because mm -hmm. Visa is, perhaps one of the best known brands in the world, but it's not a company that is well known to most people. So it's the brand and who we are and what we do is less well known. Right. So for the last 60 years since our inception, we've, we've had one simple and single point of focus, and that is to, to spread the benefits, the security and the convenience benefits of digital payments to displace cash. And um, so we're, we're on that mission across the planet. And if in future there are life forms on other planets, we'll be the first ones there too. <laughs> now, our business is, is simply to try and displace cash. That's the first part of spreading the benefits of uh, digital payments. And if you look at the, uh, the countries that we are talking about, cash is still king. So from Ukraine to Kazakhstan, Belarus, Cash continues to be between 85 to 95 percent of what we call personal consumption expenditure. So as people spend in their daily lives, uh, it's vastly still cash. So for us, 
the focus is displacing cash. It's the part that can be converted into more efficient forms of payment, more secure forms of payment. So, so on our mission, there are times when that movement is faster, and there are times the movement's a little slower, but there's always forward movement. So our growth rates may change. The amount of disposable income people have and their spending pat patterns may, you know, people may reduce the amount of money they spend, but a greater proportion of that is becoming digitized. So our business doesn't shrink, it continues to grow. What changes is the rate of growth. And so when we look at, um, and, and our business model is such that, you know, we, we don't lend money, we don't borrow money. So a liquidity squeeze, a credit squeeze, actually doesn't affect Visa directly at all. It only affects the participants in the Visa ecosystem, the financial institutions, the consumers, depending on what their disposable income is. So, so our mission doesn't change, and we really don't do anything dramatically different when we go through economic cycles. We do, we do sensible stuff, you know, which we all do. When we have more money to spend, we spend more money. When we have less money to spend, we spend a little less money. And uh, this region has always been attractive to us and will continue to remain attractive. And economic cycles are just uh, a way to mark the passage of time because we know good times don't last I and mean, we also know bad times don't last. And um, the population in these countries have a history of uh, education, they're, they're quite evolved societies. You will find more scientists, mathematicians, sports people, lawyers uh, in, in, than in other emerging <laughs> markets. And all of that helps us accelerate the, the digitization of payments because there's greater awareness, there's greater financial literacy. And so that, so all we try to do is try and work with governments, we try and work with our clients, which are the financial institutions, our partners, which are merchants where you spend money, and try and see what problems they're trying to overcome and help them overcome their problems. So if we look at the governments across the countries we are talking about here in this forum, uh, increasingly governments are pushing for electronic payments there are many benefits to them, and one of them is transparency and documentation of the economy. So we know where money is going, how is it being used. And, and, uh, and the governments are in increasingly interested in innovation. With so much cash to displace, and with so much happening in the world of technology today, it's less about repeating the old formula. We're sitting in Dubai. I used to work with Citibank when we, uh, when you know, Citibank launched credit cards here. That was a quarter century ago. And this is a very evolved market, Dubai and UAE in particular. But we're not repeating that same cycle because that cycle was the old cycle of trying to work one plastic at a time. So governments want innovation. We believe innovation and technology has a role to play. So a lot of our work is around new and more efficient ways to pay. We have to leapfrog some technologies from the past. In uh, uh, Kazakhstan, for example, they were one of the first adopters of mobile points of sale equipment in taxis. Uh, although cash is still king, you see that. In Georgia, in the entire Simia region, the central um, and Eastern Europe, Middle East and Africa region, they're the most advanced when it comes to contactless payments. And in Ukraine and these other countries I mentioned, a number of our partners are working on mobile payment applications using cloud-based computing. And so all of this is now beginning to come together. And as, you know, um, as a famous person from Silicon Valley said, we overestimate change in the short term and we underestimate change in the long run. And um, I think we are overestimating the change in the next six months, but I think we are underestimating the change in the next five years. And I think what we will see is, is, is a rapid transformation. And our job is there to work with our partners, mm -hmm. governments, banks, uh, the consumer, to make sure we're delivering what works for the ecosystem. That's, that's our job. We can only be successful if we're solving problems for these partners and uh, governments. And, and if we do that successfully, the results will happen for the benefit of all. And uh, taking on from that, I mean, the audience here are 
are, are here because they want to learn about investment opportunities and opportunities for them to participate in that expansion and growth across the region. So as you're talking about this kind of move towards uh, digital cash and, and reducing um, the cash in the system, w where do you see the opportunities for people in this audience? Uh, what type of, of uh, support services or, or, or ancillary services, et cetera, that you will see will grow, uh, not in competition to Visa, but alongside Visa? What, what, what areas should people be looking at? You know, if, if, if we look at the region we are talking about, you could say in some ways that these countries were born only 25 years ago. They have huge history and they have rich history in the region, but it was a very different system 25 years ago. And, uh, and, and so I think the first thing I would say is to think of them as young countries that will grow quickly, despite the geopolitics, despite all the problems they're having, there are a lot of growing pains in the banking system and so on, but these will pass. And, uh, and as these countries grow and mature, I would just say that this is a good time to plan for when the bad times will pass, because they will pass. We've seen that over and over again. So I would think there's opportunity, given the history of the people, the level of education, the level of sophistication, they just, they, they're still they're still becoming global, but they have all the ingredients, and they will only become really global to the extent that the rest of the globe is willing to work with them. So I wouldn't pick one industry versus the other because I'm not a specialist in any industry. Sometimes I'm not sure I'm even a specialist in my own industry, but I would just suggest that one should be able to, one should be able to acknowledge the challenges that exist today, but yet look at the rich history and the op opportunity across the board in all of these uh, countries in the next 10 years or so. And would it be naive to say you should look at, say, a highly developed economy, uh, let's say Singapore or Dubai, uh, Hong Kong, et cetera, highly developed economies, to look at them and see how things work here today and then assume in 10, 15 years that's the way it's going to be in Uzbekistan or, or, or Tajikistan, et cetera. Would that be a stupid way to look at it or is in other words, will this evolve? People will adopt these technologies. I think the beauty of evolution is we can never predict exactly what yeah. things will be like, especially in the world we live in today. Um, there are certain conditions that existed and exist in Dubai or the UAE, in Singapore and Hong Kong, all places that I have lived in. Those conditions, if you, if you really think about them, is about the, the, the benefits that come from being very small. Mm. And so Hong Kong doesn't scale up to become a China. Uh, and so I think what we need to be careful of when we, is when we try to predict how countries will evolve is to actually step back and understand what were the, what were the conditions that needed to exist for a Dubai to happen. What were the conditions that needed to exist and, um, and the role of governments and see how much of that is relevant right. in larger populations? Okay, okay. Um, Andre, you talked in, in your introductory remarks about partnerships and working with locals, et cetera. So can I ask the same question for investors uh, looking at you know, what IBM is doing, thinking, okay, how can I work with you? Yeah. Where are the areas? Several things to mention. First, uh, the the level of education and the number of uh, young talents available on the market in Russia, in Ukraine, in Belarus, in uh, Kazakhstan, in Azerbaijan is uh, enormous, is fantastic. So, and currently with overall economic um, headwinds that we have, this is represents fantastic opportunity to get uh, best talents for very, very affordable price. So if uh, we see, for example, the market of uh, um, software development. It's booming market now. In all these countries, there are plenty of young companies who are developing um, fantastic applications that are being adopted around the globe. Many companies becoming global and many becoming targets. And you can see the number of giants who are acquiring the companies in the, uh, in, in the CIS countries. And I think um, this is one of the areas where we can benefit from and what IBM also enjoying is that we have our own research uh, uh, center in Moscow working with uh, Skolkova Foundation 
that we have, we have specialist experts working on the uh, global projects development. We have, um, as I said, invested in the uh, resource delivery center, and this is international center, working not only for Russia, so we have international clients from other countries working in this center, and we're going to continue. I think uh, regarding investments area, while we have strong education and we have a lot of ta talents on the market, still there is not enough expertise because the demand is huge in the country, but uh, the number of specialists, number of professionals is, uh, is not, uh, not enough. Mm -hmm. So one of the areas for big opportunity is education services. Right. Especially governments are paying a lot of attention to the university education, but also the business schools. So we see that um, business schools in Russia and in Kazakhstan, for example, they're emerging very fast because there is a demand. Right. So I think these are also area of opportunity. And also I think uh, with um, international, overall internationalization of economy, when more and more economical uh, development is uh, what's happening in one country is impacting the other countries, I think this, um, uh, I would say, in the infrastructural projects are very important, like transportation projects, uh, building the bridges between Asia and Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, there are lots of opportunities that are being discussed now, a lot of projects around it, and I think we can uh, witness in the future um, a lot of business opportunities related to infrastructure right. projects uh, in, in this territory. Yeah, actually, just coming on from that, one of the, the I guess, the, the phrases we hear now very often in, in, in Russia, and beginning to hear it in Kazakhstan as well, is is import substitution, it's localization, domesticization, yeah. whatever the phrase is, it amounts to the same thing, uh, which is trying to source more locally. So again, if you're in the audience here and you think, okay, I see there's an opportunity in, in, in Russia perhaps to, 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 to uh, create a business linked with digital cash or with your business, et cetera, and the question is, you know, can I do it on my own? as somebody coming from Dubai or outside Russia or outside Kazakhstan, can I do it my own? Or should I be looking for a local partner? Or, you know, so, so what are the, the pitfalls and, and, and how would you advise a company who goes about it? Yeah, I think it's very natural answer to say, yes, you should look for the partnership. Because uh, there's always local specifics, local history, relationship, uh, knowledge of specific uh, processes or um, depending on the, uh, what your business is about, we in IBM looking very carefully for this import substitution trends that happening in the in, in the countries, and uh, we creating new partnerships. We have OEM partners for our hardware business, yeah. and we have also uh, OEM approach to the software development, because uh, the country needs localized solutions, being developed in Russia, supported by Russian companies, and having local uh, specifics reflect, uh, reflected in the in the solution. So we offering for such partnership our platforms that can be used for development of such uh, final solutions that will right. be local intellectual property, but based on our components. And I think this is mutually beneficial approach. So we uh, already see the outcome. We see the big uh, growth of such opportunities. And uh, we believe that this is a very good example how we can create more value for the local economy while benefit uh, business-wise ourselves. Right, okay. Uh, and Cameron, I guess it's logical then uh, move on to, to, to your business. Uh, and of course, one of the big headlines, uh, and I, uh, fair to say, one of the negative headlines has sustained the perception, particularly of Russia as being a difficult place to do business, has been the move towards kind of uh, bringing within the domestic domain, data protection, uh, data processing, uh, processing uh, even transactions involving uh, visa, et cetera. So, you know, th this is a trend that we've, we, we saw initially in Russia in the oil sector, so-called strategic sector. It's now broadening out into what the government deems to be strategic, which is information flow. So is, is this something that you're able to work around uh, is this something that investors should be worried about, or it's just part of normal process? Well, what's your what's your take on what on, on, on what's this and what damage or opportunity it might create? So, uh, my personal view and experience on Russia, and then I'll talk a little bit about 
Visa and, and the, the company. My personal view is that it, has, it is a wonderful place to do business. This is my experience. I've been there several times. It's part of the region I manage. My interactions with our clients, our partners, are some of the best. You know, it's, it's very transparent. We have excellent relationships with our clients, with government. So I think um, it remains a mystery to me why people find it hard to do business there. And it only remains a mystery because that's the opposite of my experience. With, with regard to what's happening with uh, the role of government as it relates to um, our sector, see, it, my view as a citizen, you know, wherever I live, I'm involved with working under a government because I'm a citizen of the planet. Um, a government's principal role could or should be, in my opinion, providing security. And I, by security, I don't mean physical security just from bodily harm, but, you know, security of uh, life, liberty, and security of uh, economic security. And that's, that's, part, that's part of what every government is supposed to do. That's their number one job. And so if decisions are made that a government believes is, is, is in the interest of their citizens and their economic security, their political security, uh, I think it's not useful to view that as a challenge or an opportunity. It, it, the important thing is to accept that and understand that. Now, having said that, our job is in our field is to talk about and engage with government to see what is it that they're solving for and how and where are we part of the solution and often we are and there are parts where we're not part of the solution and therefore you know if, if any government inclu including russia where you know some of you may have heard about um you know where there's a there's a national company that now processes all domestic payments etc um that's fine but our view is one, the more the competition, the better. And frankly, I often wish we had more competition than we do globally right now. So it's great to see China, Union Pay, and others uh, come into the field because greater competition is good for everyone, including me personally, our teams, the consumer, and somebody benefits. But to have greater con uh, competition, it needs to be open. And when we close competition down between domestic and foreign, I think in this balance between protecting the consumer and innovation and the future, um, it tilts too much towards just protecting the consumer. I think protecting the consumer should also create opportunities for innovation. And that's where global companies have a role to play because we have the globality, the scale to move good ideas, good products and services quickly. So we will continue to work with governments everywhere and find that right balance between protecting the consumer and allowing innovation, which in the long run actually benefits the consumer. So engagement to me is the answer. I wouldn't walk around it. I wouldn't look to find a way around it. It's a question of making sure that we can have the trust that allows people to understand what is everyone solving for and what are the areas we cooperate in and which is the areas we have a different viewpoint and, and that's fine. So I've, I've never viewed this as a, as a challenge. I spend a lot of my time talking to government officials across the region. Every time I go there, I'm simply trying to understand what is it that they're solving for and whether we can provide them another perspective. And, that, and I think that is the answer. The answer is engagement that leads to a better answer for all right. while acknowledging that the government's principal duty is always to provide security in all forms to its people. Thank you. We're actually getting, uh, thank you, we're getting uh, lots of questions now coming into to the app. So Cameron, before I leave you, uh, one, one question. Uh, I guess it's to do with the perception of, of Russia and Central Asia as being a kind of a borderline lawless or a crazy place. And the, the question simply is, do you have an issue, a bigger issue with credit, credit card fraud in the CIS than everywhere else? And, and do, have you had to adapt to different measures to, to tackle it, or is it a problem any more than anywhere else? So the payments business, which is what we do, the, that's the industry of, we, of which perhaps we have the highest 
share uh, around the planet, it's every time you create greater convenience, you create an opportunity for misuse or fraud. The further you get the transaction from the person engaging in the transaction, you create opportunity for fraud. You create opportunity for somebody trying to find a way to access money they should not be trying to access. So that's just a fact of life. And our job is to make sure that our safety and convenience, the, the pace at which it moves, is the same pace at which we move our risk management uh, processes. So if I take you back before mobile payments, which are happening around the world in, you know, in, in different shapes and forms, uh, it was, we would build a product, like call it a credit card, a debit card, whatever it is, and then we would figure out how to manage the risk. What has changed very fundamentally, and this is a huge change for the benefit of consumers and the health of the payments business, is risk management is built into a product idea from the start. So Apple launched something called Apple Pay. Apple Pay is powered by Visa, MasterCard, Amex. When you use Apple Pay, every time you, you see a little app there, an icon, and you use it, the security is built right through that. Uh, I, won't, I, won't, I won't confuse you by getting into great details on risk management because I'll confuse myself also. But, but it has changed the way we build products. And that is why the new products that are taking shape are able to deliver secure payments more secure, securely than they did in the past. After that, I won't give you any other trade secrets. You'll just have to take my word for it that, uh, it, it, that risk is now built into product. It is not attached to a product later. Okay, thank you. Um, a question for you, Andre. Um, the, it's the, 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 the question says, you, IBM, as you say, has been in, in Moscow or has been in Russia since 1974. And, and according to the question, uh, it said it seems as if every five or so years you've got a change of management, a change of, of partners. Um, and there's a, a lack of sort of transparency in terms of, of, of why that's happening or, or what's going on. So the question is uh, from, the, from the audience, how can new investors coming into Russia today, do they have the same issues to deal with or have we moved on from those kind of old Soviet legacy days or if not, what they should be looking at as new entrants to avoid that. And I'm going to tag on one extra last question to that, which I guess relates to the credit card fraud, is the perception of Russia being a place which is rife with corruption, that it's impossible to do anything without giving somebody a brown envelope. So, you know, ha have we moved on from that also, or, or, or where mm. uh, is this an issue still to be of concern? Mm. I think uh, as, a, as a whole world, Russia specifically is a country which is transforming. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't say that it's, uh, first, it is possible to do business in Russia without corruption. It is possible to do business, and I think IBM is one of the examples how it is, uh, it is possible. So we have, um, Russian government put a lot of uh, attention to this topic, bringing more and more transparency into the business, but also new technologies that are being offered, like cloud technology, like uh, uh, analytics, like security uh, businesses. Mm -hmm. I think all of them eventually help us to build a more transparent, more, uh, I would say, sophisticated, technologically sophisticated uh, business approach. And one thing what is important that in our countries, it's not just Russia, it's all countries, um, we don't have the level of maturity in, for example, IT technology usage. It means that we can implement some innovative technology without, without the pressure of the legacy systems. So we can make leapfrog jumping to the most innovative technology right now without uh, extra effort. And I think this is a good opportunity for business yeah. overall. Yeah, and I guess the same then would apply, I guess, to them, even the more emerging CIS states. Uh, let's take 
uh, Uzbekistan, which is a very big, second biggest population uh, in, in the region, but it's very far behind. So again, it's, it, it's that leapfrog, as you say. You can see it in the taxis, mobile phones. They just all yes, for it. example, the adoption of Uber in Russia yeah. was actually done in parallel with all other countries in the world. Yes. And if you, and, and, and we even heard the new economic term, Uberization, when uh, companies like Uber are exploring the market and exploding the market at the speed of light. So basically, companies like Airbnb, Uber, um, uh, and Alibaba, for example, okay. from China. Uh, Alibaba now in Russia is the largest uh, uh, electronic retailer without any shop in Russia, right? So they, they became the most popular. They have fully Russian web page, all the uh, titles for the old goods they sell, they're in Russian, and, and, and it's very easy. So I, I was using myself. Uh, when my kids wanted to buy some toy, uh, they found the link on the, through the Google, and uh, they accepted my Visa card, <laughs> and then they delivered. Thank you. Right? And it's, it, it, it's, it's done in a matter of a few days. Very. So uh, you can see how companies entering the market, or even like Alibaba, not entering the market, but they are still creating the service that is used by everybody who wants to use it, right? And it's uh, exploding very fast. And I think this is a trend. This is what's happening. The, mm. the new players, like Uber, uh, uh, they, 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 it's even said that if you sometimes you work in the industry and you don't know when new disruptive technology can come and wipe out your um, uh, your relevance for the, for the for this business right so and if you see such enemy probably it's already too late that's why uh, everybody is discussing innovation now and a lot of international companies and big companies they uh, they want to to predict they want to to work in advance to prepare themselves for such competition, which is very difficult uh, to do because we don't know. That's why, for example, IBM is now actively investing in the interactive experience area. Uh, so we're building the expertise how to design the systems from the very beginning to the uh, customer experience and what you just said about uh, uh, how to implement the security in the product before uh, you have actually experience a threat. So I think this is the future of technology, when we will be developing um, the new products, new solutions, new technology, with all these aspects in mind. So we can compete with someone who is not exist, who doesn't exist yet. So I think this is uh, yes. valid for all countries and for Russia and CS countries CIS. as well. Yeah, and actually just uh, on that one quick comment on e-commerce. Um, they, before the crisis, Russia was the world's fifth biggest retail market, consumer market. Uh, obviously, it's, uh, in dollar terms, has, has, has fallen very sharply since. But e-commerce is growing very fast. It's the fastest growing segment, even in this downturn of the retail market. As, as retailers are closing to so shopping mall space or downtown, they're going into e-commerce. But even today, the scale of the opportunity is that e-commerce only accounts for 3.5% or about 3% of the total retail market whereas it's, say, 15% in the UK market, which is the most developed in Europe. So huge amount of scope in areas like e-commerce, new, new, new technologies. Um, we, we, we've got a few minutes left, so let me uh, go back to, uh, to you, Cameron, and ask you just to, to go back to that uh, question of, of the regulatory environment, because we, we get in questions last couple of days about opportunities, which, which we've been talking about, but also a lot of concern uh, about the regulatory environment and, and, and the difficulty of, of navigating through all the, the regulations. And uh, you know, this is something that you've been talking about before, about trying to get governments to balance the right regulatory environment to create investment opportunities, uh, as, as well as the, um, you know, the, the protection or regulatory environment they want to create. How are you approaching that, or, or how do you see that trend in CIS? Is it something that's worrying you or improving? Or? Well, I think if you look at our industry, what's happening in our industry is probably the same as what has happened in other industries, which is when an industry grows and uh, grows quickly and becomes of a large size or is already of a large size, 
it has greater impact on the, uh, on the economy and governments start taking a greater interest in it. And, and rightly so. So I think success automatically leads to greater government interest. And so it's a sign of success. The only places governments are, aren't interested is with this complete failure and nothing is happening and they're not interested. So I think one just has to accept that as a matter of fact, uh, rather than try and pass a verdict on it, whether government is good or bad, because that's not useful. It doesn't lead to a useful outcome to form a view on that, other than to understand that that's reality. Um, governments, I mean, if I can simplify the way I understand it, governments act out of uh, two factors. One is if they believe that for security, economic security, social security, security in all its aspects, they need to get involved with an industry. The other is if they believe there is a trust deficit between the government and an industry or the players in an industry. And for both of these things, the, to me there is only one answer. Engage with government because often the, the adversarial role uh, or position against government or to oppose government cannot ever lead to a good outcome for anyone. So I think the thing that I would focus on is how do you engage with government to be sure we understand what is it that they're solving for and where their concern is and, and to actually listen and try and understand before we pass judgment on it. And the other part is that engagement should lead to greater transparency, the more the transparency and the more the governments understand what it is that you're doing, why you're doing it, and, if that, and, and, and use that as a way to find what is the common ground because where we will be effective the most is on the common ground between government and companies. So to that extent, the answer is lies with companies and industries like ourselves. It's in our, the ball is in our court, as we say, to sort of come back and deal with the situation and find out w what is that healthy balance. And, and that's the way I suggest we need to start in any situation where we have a problem of communication, of intention. And we're doing a lot of that. Um, you know, in Belarus, we're working with the government on a financial literacy program. Mm -hmm. They have a concern about, you know, whether it's electronic payments, credit cards, that people may not understand what they're getting into. And we said, fine, we will work with you and see how we can contribute to literacy, financial literacy. Uh, in other places, we go to government and say, you know, you want to have your own domestic processing scheme? Great idea. Maybe we can give you some ideas on how to get it right, but don't deprive your uh, consumers of the benefits of dealing with a global company because innovation is kicking in. Dialogue and, 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 and just an appreciation of the viewpoint of government, the answer lies in how we approach it rather than how we decide upon it right. without engaging. Okay. We're coming up to the end of the session, but I've got uh, one last question for each of you from the app and then also ask you just to sum up to give us your very just quick take on, on how you see the region. Are you optimistic, worried, how, how you see your future? And the question, Cameron, for, for you is, you talked about uh, the digital cash to move in that direction. Uh, and the question is, are you worried or is there a role for Bitcoin uh, model within sort of the digital uh, transaction age, as it were? Do you think Bitcoin is something real would survive? So, um, I am not an expert on anything and certainly not on Bitcoin. I'm just an observer of what Bitcoin is doing. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but the answer will come from if Bitcoin Bitcoin provides more relevance to, the, to, its, uh, to its users who want to use it, it will flourish and if it doesn't uh, provide the relevance, it may remain a small play. Don't know, what I, hear, what I hear more often than not is the technology underpinning Bitcoin, blockchain, has tremendous and vast opportunities beyond the Bitcoin um, experiment if you like. Mm. So if I, if I was to make a guess, I think we will see the technology underlying Bitcoin uh, flourish in ways that we don't know yet know how it will. But as I always say, um, 
I, I personally, I don't worry about new things. I worry about our own relevance. And I think, you know, they say the, the, I have seen the enemy, it is I. Uh, it, we, just, we just have to focus on being relevant for the people we serve, and then everybody else is welcome to join the party. Okay. Um, and Andre, then uh, ask you a final question. Uh, the question this says about, is, refers to the outsourcing of services you mentioned. The question is, are you mainly catering to European clients, I guess as distinct from Russian clients? And then there's a the technical part of it. What ERP programs uh, are popular with your, with your clients? Uh, and there is an addendum from somebody else, which I should ask you is, is, do you have the same sponsorship obligations in CAS as in GCC? In other words, can you keep all the profits that you make or do you have to share with a local partner? Yeah, I think uh, pretty much so. Uh, so ERP market in Russia is similar to any other countries in the world. Actually, for SAP, Russia is a very big market, I think number four worldwide. Um, and uh, when we have outsourcing of business processes, we do not own the software applications. We work in the applications installed or used by the clients. So right. this is not... Uh, um, um, no, no, any conflict there. Okay. Um, so. All right. The very last question. <laughs> Excited about future in CIS of the yeah. five, ten year view? Still. I'm confident, and I agree with uh, Karim said that uh, we have um, ups and downs in our economies, and uh, all these uh, issues they will be over at some point. And uh, the, this territory represents huge potential, both in business and social life, and will contribute a lot to the world economy uh, in the future. That's um, I'm very excited because the, the foundations exist, and those were the things I referred to earlier. Um, and I'm very excited. Things are going a little slower than we all would want it. There are some challenges, but I think wisdom requires us to be able to focus on the foundations and be a little bit patient, pace our investments, but be able to see th that there is a lot more potential in that region than I think we understand because it's not a region that is well understood around the world. They're young countries and we should just remember that with strong foundations and that's why I'm, I'm very excited. I'm very excited to be here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that's the, the end of our session. Uh, let me remind you, please, that the next session is, the last session is coming up next, Transforming Global Value Chains. So please uh, stay in your seats for the start of that section. And can I ask you then just to show your appreciation and thanks for Andre and, and, and Cameron for this session. So thank you very much. Please remain in your seats for the next session.